The biggest mistake that we can make while reading The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is to view Dr. Jekyll as this good, moral man and Mr. Hyde as this evil, immoral figure, as though they were two separate entities. If you do that, then you miss the entire point of the story. Hey guys, I am Dr. Whitney Custers, professor of English, super excited to discuss all the things in Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, because it is a novella that explores the most troubled orthodoxy from Freudian psychoanalysis to Darwinian theories to Christian morality and existence. Before diving into all of this, please take a second to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell as I do post weekly lectures on writing and the literature that you will likely come across in school and just in life in general. So, Jekyll and Hyde was published in 1886, a time when the British Empire was a global juggernaut, known as the empire upon which the sun never set because it ruled over a quarter of the world's population. Great Britain was considered the pinnacle of civilization, the wealthiest and most powerful and advanced nation. And you're probably all familiar with the rather prude and proper image that the Victorians cultivated and upheld, staunchly promoting Christian principles, morality, and refined behavior, and denying a lot of self-pleasure. But beneath this exterior of propriety, there existed a whole underworld of crime, drugs, sex, and vice. Prostitution was rampant, as were opium dens and crime, salacious magazines like The Pearl were published for a bit, and Jack the Ripper sensationalized the population and held their collective consciousness in the latter part of the century. Now, I'm not saying that everyone was engaged in this underbelly of society, certainly not. But know that within the cities, the lower and upper classes shared a close proximity with one another, despite the upper class wanting nothing to do with their social inferiors. So this was a problem as Victorians were taught to repress, ignore, or deny anything that was socially unacceptable, rendering them a rather stifled group of people. But they were human, so surely these instinctual desires had to come out at some time or another. So if you've read the story, then you probably noticed that all the men in the book are unmarried, emotionally stifled, and pretty joyless. Utterson, our narrator, for instance, is not the guy you're going to invite out for a fun time. A lawyer and a highly respected citizen in the community, Utterson is austere with himself, practicing abstinence, most likely out of Christian duty. It's a practice of saying no to the smaller things so that the temptation to commit greater sin is not there. In fact, the only frivolity he seems to enjoy is the theater, but even then it's said that he's not been in two decades. Utterson, we're told, never smiles, refuses to make new friends, and is described as being cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse. But despite this, he is our narrator, and in true Utterson fashion, he utters this rather sensational story with a dry and an elevated tone. In some ways, this makes him an ideal narrator since he's not overly dramatic or prone to wild tales. He treats the story rather scientifically and with his renowned tolerance toward other people's misconduct. Remember, he says, I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. The thing you need to know is that tolerance was an uncharacteristic quality of the Victorians and so is very integral to Utterson's role as narrator because Jekyll needs a tolerant friend to whom he can expose his most vulnerable side. But Utterson's tolerance, I think, does not simply come from indifference, sympathy, or kindness. I think it comes from empathy and fear because when Utterson suspects that Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll, it's said that Utterson, scared by the thought, brooded a while on his own past, groping in all the corners of memory, lest by some chance some jack-in-the-box of an old iniquity should lead to light there. This tells us that despite, despite his status as a professional, respectable, civilized lawyer, Utterson also has a hide that has come out in his past, so in some ways he may be more understanding of Jekyll's situation. And even now, he's not wholly moral. Remember that he's willing to let Jekyll get away with his misdeeds. For instance, he knows that Jekyll is responsible for Carew's death and is fine saying nothing to the police. He's also an ideal narrator because he barely understands and knows what's going on. Remember, Hyde has been doing this for years, and when Enfield tells Utterson, I make it a rule of mine, the more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask, Utterson wholeheartedly agrees, saying, a very good rule. I think it would be too much, too chaotic to have someone like Jekyll narrate the story. This is why there is so much that remains unspoken. 
Utterson, as an outsider to Jekyll and Hyde's misdeeds, has restricted access, relating everything through witnesses' accounts, documents, and other paperwork, and only after the facts. And this is a common convention of Gothic narratives, um, you know, like think Dracula, Frankenstein, for instance. For one thing, the documents give the narrative a bit more of a realist feel, but they also serve as a sort of proof that we all seek in unbelievable circumstances like these. In addition, you probably notice that we are privy to very few of Hyde's actions and sins. For one thing, the details violate reading decorum, and evil is gestured at because these horrible things can never be horrifying enough, and they might become cheesy or funny. And when the reader is left to their own imagination, we will project onto Hyde the most awful and terrible misdeeds that make us shudder. So the narrative's omissions are all very purposeful. Now, the thing is, at this time, your class was tied up with your moral state. No one thought twice about an impoverished person committing a crime or sin. But when someone like Dr. Jekyll, you know, this doctor, Christian, a fellow of royal society and a lawyer commits a great sin, it was terrifying and shocking. You'll notice that there are no members of the underworld in this novella, and that's very deliberate. Unfortunately, if the characters were all artful dodgers or fagans, Victorian readers would have thought, well, that's what we expect from this lower class. Stevenson, though, gives us all middle and upper class respectable men, except for the one woman who witnesses the murder of Carew. Why are there really no women in this story, you ask? Well, because Victorian society was a patriarchal one. It's the middle and upper class men who run the world and make the rules, but yet are the ones who are totally hypocritical. So this novella reminds us that if someone like Dr. Jekyll, who represents the pinnacle of civilization, is tempted by and capable of the worst, then we all are. And not only that, but the real terror here is that because Hyde already naturally exists in all of us, it's just a matter of letting him out. And you don't have to have the potions or the scientific knowledge to do so. Our Hyde comes out in the most flagrant ways at times or in subconscious ways like Freudian slips or defense mechanisms like projection and displacement. So you need to ask yourself, who is your Hyde and how do you manage him? Now, hopefully your version is not as wicked as Mr. Hyde in the novella, but surely you have urges and desires that society says you must repress, ignore, and control. And that brings me to a major issue that is considered in this novella, and that is the matter of Christianity. I think that this novella questions the existence of Christianity in some ways, and at the same time, it questions the Christian standards by which society measures immorality, wickedness, and propriety. For one thing, in 1886, when the story was published, homosexuality obviously existed and was a way some people privately identified, but publicly it was scandalous, immoral, and illegal according to social norms and Christian theology. And so there are hints that perhaps one of the wicked things Hyde is doing is engaging in some sort of homosexual behavior in the middle of the night, though it's never confirmed. It's also suggested that he frequents opium dens or other drug houses, rendering him a highly immoral figure. But my point is, think about how much our collective mentality has changed on homosexuality and drugs like marijuana, for instance. I mean, you sort of can't drive into town without seeing one or two weed shops on every corner. It's no longer a sin. And nowadays, not only is homosexuality not illegal and no longer considered immoral, but we have Pride Week to celebrate as a nation, gay culture, and people. So that's all to say that men like Jekyll may have had pretty harmless desires and needs within them, but were forced to repress them in a highly intolerant society. In fact, Jekyll explains he always felt this dual nature within himself, saying, And indeed, the worst of my faults was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as has made the happiness of many, but such as I found it hard to reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than common grave countenance before the public. Hence it came about that I concealed my pleasures, and that when I reached years of reflection and began to look round me and take stock of my progress and position, in the world, I stood already committed to a profound duplicity in me. Now, there are no specifics, but he says the worst of his faults was an impatient gaiety of disposition. In the Victorian period, this could really mean something as innocent as dancing, expressing one's emotions, singing a body song, reading a novel, etc. 
But because such things were expected to be repressed, these desires could become explosive and more evil in nature, which may explain why Hyde beats Sir Danvers' crew to death. To our knowledge, which admittedly is pretty limited, Hyde hasn't done anything like this before. It's said that Hyde breaks out in a great flame of anger, stamping his foot and brandishing the cane like a madman with an ape-like fury. And it seems to come out of nowhere. We're simply told that prior to the beating, Hyde was listening to Carew with ill-contained impatience. Though remember that even this is dubious since it's coming from a witness who was sitting rather far away from the two men and wasn't privy to the entire conversation. What's important to keep in mind is that for months, Jekyll hasn't let Hyde loose. Hyde has been stifled and locked up this whole time, but he finally gets out. And when he does, he clearly releases all of his pent up rage. Jekyll even says, my devil had long been caged and he came out roaring. On the one hand, we can read this and argue that we have real vices and sins and we give into temptations like Adam and Eve do. So if we give our hide an inch, you know, he can take a mile and eventually consume us as he does with Jekyll. But on the other hand, it's suggested that the more we try to hide the truth about ourselves, the greater the need to release them, show them, be them. And as I said, maybe this need was so great that Hyde completely lost it. Perhaps this is a criticism against a society that imposes too many restrictions on our natural selves and without any sort of real outlet, these impatient gaieties of disposition turn much more sinister. Let me know what you guys think about what I just said here. So let's take the incident in which Hyde and a young girl naturally run into one another on the street as the girl is running as hard as she is able and she just turns the corner and there's Hyde. Now, Hyde just keeps on going, trampling over the girl who we are told is not hurt, just frightened. Now, it's certainly not a good thing to run over anyone and just keep on going. But the real thing I think Stevenson wants us to focus on is not Hyde. I mean, after all, we know he's evil, but rather the way in which these middle to upper class Christians react to the generally relatively harmless incident. Enfield says that they had to keep the women off of Hyde as they were wild as harpies and that he had never seen such a circle of hateful faces. And the group, including the dry, emotionalist doctor, felt a desire to kill Hyde. But since killing is out of the question, Enfield says, we did the next best thing. And that is that this group of Christians suddenly turns into a mob that blackmails Hyde, threatening to cut off his credit and ending his friendships across London. And they only leave him be after he gives the family a hundred pounds, which in today's money is a whopping 16,000 pounds, which in USD is over $19,000. So instead of showing Christian forgiveness, as is expected, this entire group reveals their own inner hides. Now, this brings me to Darwin and his theories on evolution, which, if you don't already know, was a major point of contention in the 19th century. Scientific discoveries and ideas in general created a lot of anxiety, concern, and excitement in the Victorian period. Remember that the Victorian period was also known as the Age of Transition. So much was changing at a very rapid pace. People didn't quite know how to reconcile the discovery of a dinosaur bone or Darwin's theories that humans are descended from this common ape-like ancestor with the story of Genesis and their Christian beliefs. Hyde embodies this anxiety and confusion with his animalistic nature and his triglodytic appearance. Throughout the novel, Hyde is associated with animals. For one thing, his name is Hyde, which is a clear reference to the fact that he is hidden within Jekyll and within respectable society, but it's also a reference to animal skin. He is said to do things with a hissing intake of breath. He cries out like a rat, growls and snarls and gives out a dismal screech as of a mere animal terror. And he plays ape-like tricks on Jekyll. And Jekyll references Hyde when he says that there was an animal within me licking the chops of memory. Utterson feels an unknown disgust, loathing, and fear for Hyde and says the man hardly seems human, something triglodytic. And even as he dies, Hyde twitches, a movement that's in keeping with his animal tendencies. In other words, Hyde is a devolved figure, someone who illustrates that humans can easily regress despite the belief that humans are constantly moving towards progress. So here again, Stevenson raises, raises within us that very real fear that beneath the veneer of civilized behavior resides in all of us our true nature. We are perhaps animals refined by education, purpose, religion, and law. 
But while these things can refine control and hide the hides in us, even sometimes from ourselves through denial, projection, and repression, it still does not eliminate the fact that at our core, we are instinctual animals and that it only takes one potion to undo all of this. Remember that Hyde does not appear out of thin air. I mean, he is Jekyll. Jekyll is not a morally upstanding guy whatsoever. He simply maintains the image of one. And you can argue that Jekyll is trying to invent Hyde into an entirely different person as a way to keep his conscience clean, to shoulder no responsibility for his misdeeds, but don't let him fool you. Hyde is Jekyll and Jekyll is Hyde. In some ways, then, Stevenson is forcing us to question so many things at once. Where does our conscience and consciousness lie? Who are we? Do we truly have a soul? Is Christianity a narrative we've created to justify and manage our temptations and our real nature? What drives our behavior? Is our moral behavior determined by the fear of getting caught? I mean, that's Jekyll's fear after all. Or is it being ostracized and severely judged and punished? You can perhaps answer the question by asking it of yourself. Why do you behave properly? Is it because you are afraid of how others will judge you, see you, what they will say of you? Is it because you really, truly are innately a good moral person? Is it because it's just what you have always been taught? Is it simply because there are rules and laws that we are expected to follow and we are trained to do so? Is it because you are embarrassed, ashamed, or afraid to get into trouble? Is it because you have religious convictions? Is it because you are afraid that to dabble in any temptation will lead to ruin as it does for Jekyll? Share with me in the comments. Now notice that Hyde completely takes over eventually. He is the stronger of the two in every sense. Even when Jekyll knows he must kill Hyde, he doesn't, explaining that his sympathy, you know, his kindness, prevents him from doing so. He says, I who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of Hyde, when I recall the abjection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. Remember that Darwin's theory of natural selection says that when two similarly matched species compete for survival, like Jekyll and Hyde, only the one that demonstrates some small but useful variation will have an advantage, and that variety shall survive in the struggle for existence. And which of the two can adapt to change better? It's Hyde through and through. And this is why he eventually consumes Jekyll. Jekyll even says that when he went out in the guise of Hyde, he discovered a new freshness and joy in his life, that he felt younger, lighter, and happier in body, and conscious of a heady recklessness and an innocent freedom of the soul. This sounds wonderful, yeah? I mean, to be free of the restraints that cage us in all the time. In essence, Hyde is the personification of Jekyll's id, as discussed by Freud. Remember that there is a constant ongoing battle in your psyche between the id and the superego, or as I call them, the child and the puritanical parts of your brain. It's because of the moralizing, critical superego that we don't all just indulge in sin, pleasure, and desire all the time. All of this ultimately gets moderated and managed by our ego, who compromises between the id and superego. To further look into this story from a psychoanalytic point of view, you'll notice that Jekyll lives in Leicester Square and Hyde in Soho, the slum of London populated by sin. But yet, these locations are geographically right next to one another. So here is London, symbolic of Jekyll, a world that's marked by progress, power, knowledge, and civilization. But within it lies Soho, symbolic of Hyde, with its streets full of weird descriptions, slums, opium dens, and fog. And in the center of all of it is Hyde's door. When the two begin to share a home, you'll remember that Hyde is to use the secret back door and Jekyll uses the front. These entrances are on different streets, but it's all one and the same. A further study of psychoanalysis reminds us that Carl Jung saw the house as a map of the psyche, and the front of the house or the upper stories represent our public image, what we're willing to show the world, whereas the further down that you go, the further you delve into your unconscious desires and needs. These are things that are so hidden that even you may not know about them. It's fitting, then, that this is where Hyde is hidden in a house of respectability. I think what's ironic about the novella is that it's said that the later potions are impure, when really it's the first mixture, the one that allowed Jekyll to transform into Hyde, that was impure. There's a moral implication here reminding us that Jekyll is not to be messing with this. 
This is hubristic. I mean, he's messing with human nature, or is he? Is he messing with it or simply releasing it from the confines that society has imposed around it? Figures like Frankenstein and Faust are behind this novel, and so it's no surprise that neither Jekyll nor Hyde can ultimately exist. I do feel like there is so much more to say about this very complex and involved story, so maybe one day I can make more detailed videos, but for now, we've covered a lot of ground, I've asked a lot of questions, and so I would really love hearing from you and hearing what you think Stevenson is actually putting forth. Please share with me in the comment section below, and don't forget to browse through some of my other videos on writers like Orwell, Atwood, Faulkner, and Poe. I hope to see you guys there and please join me for the next one.